Cluster B personality disorders are characterized by dramatic, overly emotional, and unpredictable thoughts and behavior. From Ars Longa Media, this is Cluster B, scientifically informed, expert insights into the four Cluster B personality types, antisocial, borderline, narcissistic, and histrionic personality disorder. Here's today's host, Dr. Todd Grande. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today I'll be looking at three different questions. The first is, what is the relationship between autism spectrum disorder and empathy? I'll refer to autism spectrum disorder as ASD. The second question, is the lack of empathy different when comparing ASD to cluster B personality pathology? Third question, is empathy assessed differently for each group? So comparing ASD to cluster B in terms of how we assess empathy, how we figure out how well somebody can empathize. So first, I'll take a look here at autism spectrum disorder. We see this disorder is characterized by deficits in social communication and social interaction, along with repetitive behavior and restricted interests. Some of the deficits in social communication and interaction would include features like deficits in social-emotional reciprocity, for example, a failure to have a typical back-and-forth conversation, we see deficits in nonverbal communicative behaviors, for example, abnormalities with eye contact, and deficits in developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships. On the repetitive behavior restricted interest side, we see things like stereotyped repetitive motor movements, inflexible adherence to routines, highly restricted fixated interest, and being highly sensitive or having unusually low sensitivity to sensory input. For example, a fascination with lights or movement or an aversion to certain sounds. In terms of the prevalence of ASD, we've seen a significant change from the early 1970s to now. The disorder was diagnosed in one of 2,500 individuals back in the 1970s. It's diagnosed in one of 68 individuals now. Some of this increase may be due to better diagnosing, increased awareness, or broaden diagnostic criteria. However, these factors don't really seem to explain the entire difference, which is why many researchers believe environmental factors play a role in the unexplained increase in prevalence. This is actually pretty interesting because ASD is considered highly heritable. Some studies show that it's 90% heritable, although the average is probably closer to around 70%. This is still quite high for a mental disorder. Many mental disorders are closer to 50-50 when we compare heritability to environmentability. So we look at genetic influence versus stress. Now, in terms of who ASD affects, it affects males four times as often as females. And there are interesting theories about this. One theory is that it's more easily detected in males than females. But another theory says that ASD can be conceptualized as an extreme expression of the typical male brain. With ASD, we see a lot of systemizing and not as much empathizing. Systemizing is when somebody develops rules for organizing objects according to a system. It's considered a male-dominant trait. Empathizing is the ability to infer mental states of other people, so the ability to recognize feelings and figure out what they mean to that other person. This is considered a female-dominant trait. Now, taking a closer look at the construct of empathy itself, there are two major types of empathy, cognitive and affective. Sometimes affective is also called emotional empathy. With cognitive empathy, here we see a person can understand another person's point of view. They can see things from that person's perspective. Sometimes this is called theory of mind. Affective empathy is when a person has an emotional response to that other person's mental state. Now, we see with autism spectrum disorder that there is an atypical empathic response. We see this with other mental disorders as well. For example, cognitive empathy is often impaired with borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder. And affective empathy is often impaired with narcissistic and antisocial personality disorders, as well as schizophrenia. We know that empathy is important for social functioning. And many of the treatments for ASD focus on improving independence and quality of life, but few counseling treatments really focus on improving empathy skills. However, there is an intervention specifically designed to address the theory of mind deficit. It's referred to as theory of mind 
training, and it's specifically intended to be used with children who have ASD. Historically, the potential benefit of this type of training has been difficult to assess. Empathic responses can be difficult to detect. For example, a parent is watching a child with autism spectrum disorder and trying to figure out if that child is empathizing with another child. That's a tough perspective from which to make that type of judgment, and yet many of the assessments are based on parents completing open-ended questionnaires under these circumstances. One successful assessment technique is the use of structured observations of empathic responses. This is when a counselor or a parent evaluate the child's response to someone expressing an emotional state to that child, specifically an expression of excitement or surprise. With this method, the situation is controlled. The expression of excitement or surprise is planned. So to illustrate how this assessment works, I'm going to focus on the excitement side. Let's say that somebody makes a statement to the child in an excited tone, and they say, I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. The child's response to that statement would be noted as part of the structured observation. And this assessment divides the response into five categories. So the first category is no response or an irrelevant response. So using that statement about looking forward to tomorrow, no response would be a failure to respond or give attention. And an irrelevant response would be something like, I'm looking for a toy, right? So it has nothing to do with what the person said about being excited about tomorrow. The second category is attention without response. This is when the child pays attention to the person, but they don't actually respond to the statement. The third category is confirmatory response. Here we see something like smiling or nodding, or perhaps saying something like yes or okay. So the child with ASD is confirming they heard the other person, but they're not really going beyond that. Now, category four is relevant response. The child provides a verbal response, so perhaps something like, why, or where are you going? But there's no real empathic component. There's attention, confirmation, and relevance without empathy. The fifth category is empathic response. Here we see a relevant verbal response that also demonstrates empathy. It provides a reference to the other person's emotional state, or it could offer a solution to alleviate the person's distress. So it could be something like, that sounds like fun, or I'm glad for you. Using structured observations, theory of mind training has been shown to be effective at increasing both cognitive and affective empathy. The structured observations are not only used for assessment, but also potentially as part of the treatment, helping to focus the efforts of the counselor on areas that may be helpful. For example, perhaps the child is being attentive, but is not offering a relevant response. The counselor could determine this from looking at the assessment and adjust the treatment as needed. Now moving to the next question. Is the lack of empathy different from ASD over to cluster B personality disorders? Can this type of structured observation be used for an adult who has cluster B personality pathology? Well, cluster B contains four personality disorders, antisocial, narcissistic, borderline, and histrionic. I mentioned the first three before when I was talking about other disorders that are associated with an impairment in empathy. This is an interesting question. There are a few things to keep in mind here. First of all, this assessment is typically used with a client who has a known deficit in empathy, and improving empathy skills would be the goal. With any particular individual who has a cluster B personality disorder, improving empathy may not always be one of the goals although I think it makes sense to be set as a goal the vast majority of the time. I've noticed with cluster B personality pathology and empathy that the no response or irrelevant response category would not really be endorsed too often, right? You're not going to see many situations where an adult with a cluster B personality disorder is simply not going to respond at all. Most people would respond. Similarly, the attention without a response wouldn't be endorsed too often, but the confirmatory and relevant response. That's something we would see quite often as opposed to the empathic response. There are also a few other categories or new levels to categories that I think would have to be included if you're looking at something like cluster B personality pathology. For example, there would be a sarcastic response, potentially, a deceptive response, and a manipulative response. And interestingly, those responses would indicate the person may have some level of cognitive empathy, right? like the person understands the mental state of the other person. They simply have no interest in expressing affective empathy. 
right? So it's a little bit different than what we would expect to see with ASD. It's also important to remember that the level of functioning would typically be conceptualized as being higher with an adult who has a cluster B personality disorder as compared to a child who has ASD. Now, most of the time when working with adults who have personality disorders, empathy is assessed with self-report questionnaires as opposed to any type of structured observation. Although there is research now that indicates that these questionnaires may not work very well at all. As it turns out, individuals with cluster B personality disorders don't accurately report their own levels of cognitive empathy. For many years, the common belief was that they did. So essentially, now we see a movement back to using behavioral assessments to determine empathic ability, much like the structured assessment I talked about before when looking at ASD. Just like with so many other areas, there is pressure in the world of research to reduce costs and self-report questionnaires are affordable. But perhaps some of those who use these questionnaires in research overestimated the insight we would expect to see with cluster B personality pathology or overestimated the level of straightforwardness and honesty we would expect to see. For more content like this, check out Healthy Toxic, another podcast from Ars Longa Media, all about what makes or breaks relationships, including issues related to narcissism, narcissistic abuse, and how personality disorders affect relationships. Ars Longa, Vita Brevitz. Learn more at arslonga.media.